everybody talking. It's awesome. I'm sorry to break you up. I, I apologize. <laughs> As we begin, uh, Pastor Steve in a minute is going to be speaking from 1 Samuel 17 on David and Goliath. I want to read you some words from this. I, I didn't really have these songs in mind whenever I knew what he was speaking about. Uh, I think it was about one or two in the morning when I knew about this or something like that. <laughs> something like that. But for, let me read you a couple words. David's out there standing in front of Goliath. And, you know, it, it, it took something with, for this little kid to be out there standing against this giant. And the words that he says are pretty amazing. He said in 1 Samuel 17, 45 through 47, he says, But David replied to the Philistine, You're coming against me with sword and spear and javelin. And don't lose sight of what this is, this giant, this little kid, right? This little ruddy kid, as it says. You are coming against me with sword and spear and javelin. But I'm coming against you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of Israel's armies, whom you have defied. This very day the Lord will deliver you into my hand. I will strike you down and cut, cut off your head. This day I will give the corpses of the Philistine army to the birds of the sky and the wild animals of the land. Then all the land will realize that Israel has a God. And all this assembly will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's and he will deliver you into our hand. Can you imagine that scene of that little kid? And it probably made Goliath so, you know he was sitting there just fuming and smoking after that. But David exhibited a confidence there in God that is just so amazing. And in that same confidence, though, he's really saying, I am so in need of God because there is no way I can do this, but God is going to do it, and he's going to have the victory. That's kind of what these songs are about. This first song is In Need. This has become one of my favorite songs, um, In Need. It expresses our total need and dependence on God. But that's not weakness. That is strength in our God and, and who he is because he is all-powerful. Let's stand with me, if you would, and we're going to sing In Need. In need of grace, in need of love, in need of mercy raining down my above, in need of strength, in need of peace, in need of things that only you can give to me, in need of unmeasured. God's grace is so good. God didn't have to help, help David out there. He didn't have to do that. He could have let David die in humiliation and let all of Israel been defeated and get rid of him, right? But God's grace is so big, it's greater than all our sins. Sing with me if you would, grace unmeasured.
morning. It's good to see everybody here today, and it's exciting for us to be back, and I'm just looking forward to what we're talking about today. We're talking about uh, David and Goliath, and um, I think that all the songs that you already chosen are going to fit perfect with it, and so I'm glad that you're here. If you're joining us online, I'm happy that you're here as well, and my prayer is that this will be a great blessing uh, for you guys. Let's uh, ask God uh, for his guidance today. Father, thank you so much that we can recognize our need for you and praise you because you are, you know, you offer your grace to us. You offer your help to us. You hear us. You, um, you are looking out for our good, and we thank you for that. We thank you that um, your grace is, is unending and uh, your mercies are new every morning. And we have the privilege of being together today to praise you, and I thank you for that. I pray for your um, guidance as we uh, sing and as we study your word today that uh, we will be faithful to what you want us to learn. I pray that you will speak to uh, our hearts and our minds and that we will uh, just incline our hearts towards you, incline our hearts to obey you, uh, incline our hearts to listen to you and to desire to know and understand you better and to um, recognize your love for us and then to love you more deeply. And Lord, I thank you for everybody that's here today. Lord, I pray you these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I have no idea the emphasis of Pastor Steve's message coming up, but when I'm looking at this next song, it's called Jesus Draw Me Every Near. It's been about a year and a half since we've done this. Um, when you think about David and his life, he had a great, great victory in front of Goliath, right? I mean, he... He was known for that. He was known that uh, for dependence on God in that. Then he gets, a, you know, he gets anointed as king, you know, and then, but he goes throughout his life, and Saul just starts trying to kill him, right? And then he starts chasing him in, in the in the uh, wilderness and everything. And you can see David's pain in the Psalms. It's like, God, are you even there? You know, do you see what? I mean, you helped me with Goliath, but what, what's going on here, you know? And he's just agonizing over that. And I can really kind of hear David in this song here. Now, he, wasn't seeing, he, he was speaking directly to God, not, not necessarily Jesus the, Christ the Son, you know. But I can hear David saying, where are you? Just bring me closer. And this song says, Jesus, draw me ever near as I labor through this storm. Sing with me if you would, Jesus, draw me ever near. Jesus, draw me ever near as I labor with you and have called me to this past and I'll follow my Lord. May this journey bring a
Lord's testing with your likeness, let me wake. This last song is All I Have is Christ. We've done this many times. And every time I point out, that's all we need. It's not a despair of all I have is Christ. What else do I have? It's a, it's a rejoicing in all I have is Christ. And that's all I need. And you know David was standing in front of Goliath and he said, all I got is God. I got this little stone too, but you know, all I got is God. That's all I need. And Goliath, you're going to be defeated today. That's an awesome thing. And there's confidence in God that we can have. So sing with me if you would, all I have is Christ. I once was lost in darkness If you're part of our children's church uh, uh, ministry, if you want to follow Miss Lauren and uh, parents, if this is your first time your kids are in our church or our children's church, they'll be right downstairs, the second room on the right. You're more than welcome to go down and peek through the window to see what's happening. And uh, knowing their teacher today, you may want to, <laughs> but um. I want to thank uh, everybody that well everybody that filled in for the last two weeks while we were gone, and thanks for praying for us uh, in Peru. I got to spend some really good time with my dad, and uh, his, his breathing is getting a little more labored uh, these days, but overall we had a, you know, a good time with them, and I thank you for praying. Thanks to Tyler for preaching, for um, uh, Jerry and Chip for covering on Wednesday nights, and for all of your uh, faithfulness, and um, it was fun to to get online to see, you know, Tyler preach and, and see Chip and Jerry as well. And so I thank you for, for everything there. One announcement that I have is on the 27th of August, we have a church family picnic planned. So that'd be, I believe it's a Saturday, being that evening. And the church will provide all the drinks if you want that. We can have a grill uh, if you want to cook hot dogs or if you just want to bring, you know, something to eat. It is, you know, bring some stuff to share. And uh, I think it'll just be a great time uh, to spend time together. 
Uh, it's cooling down a little bit, so we will just meet here. We'll be inside and outside the gym. The gym's a little warm, but I think the weather's cooling down, and by that time of the evening, you know, we'll start like at 5 or so. I think it'll be cool enough to, to really have a good time. So uh, please keep that in mind, and it'd be great if all of you came, all right, and anybody you want to bring with you. So uh, again, that's the 27th for a church family picnic. You know, throughout history, God has chosen to make his name known in multiple ways. He did it through creation. The Bible says that when you look at creation, you can see the handiwork of God, right? And so God, uh, although it's not a complete revelation, it is a revelation of his power and his creativeness and his, his you know, the beauty that he, he sees. And, and he created it for his glory, but he created it for our enjoyment. And um, there's a, a book that I will talk to you a little bit in a couple weeks about, but there's a book about the evidence that it's God that created everything, and it's so many details on it, on just proof that there's no way that our world just came to be into an explosion and slowly growing. You know, there's so many intricate details, even in the human body and in the animals and, and the uniqueness of all the different animals. It's just amazing. And what it does is, the Bible says it gives us a revelation of God and we have no excuse to say there is no God. So God's revealed himself through, through um, creation and the universe. Um, he also uh, revealed himself you know, through prophets, you know, the people speaking God's word. I, we're reading through Jeremiah. Those of us who are reading through the chronological Bible, uh, there's a bunch of us from the church that have just kind of done this together. And in Jeremiah right now, there's so many times that Jeremiah says, this is what God says. And then he writes it down. And God has revealed himself through his, you know, his word. And then he reveals himself through a church. He's revealed himself through Jesus Christ. The Bible says no one has seen God except through Jesus Christ because he is God. And then he reveals, he chooses individuals to reveal himself. For example, he did it through Enoch. Enoch in Genesis walked with God and his faith you know, was was. When you study the life of Enoch, which there's not that much information, we just know that God, you're able to have an intimate relationship with God by the example that Enoch had, to the point where Enoch was just taken to heaven. You know, he's one of the very few people that never faced or haven't faced death, and he was taken right up into heaven. He did it through a Noah in, in offering to save the entire world, but only Noah and his family obeyed God, and he built this ark, and, he, and he, you know, he preached for a hundred and something years. He preached about the end of the world or the flood coming, the flood coming, and he's saying, you all need to realize that this is coming, and only his family believed, but God revealed himself through Noah and saving Noah and this ark, and you know, for a year they, they, they floated, and you see evidence of this, this massive flood everywhere. Just go to the Grand Canyon. They'll tell you that it took millions of years for that canyon to be developed, or it took a massive flood and a lot of water rushing at one time. You know, the, there's a lot of landslides going on throughout the world right now, and you see the flooding like in, in what is in Kentucky and Virginia was not too long ago. And when you see the damage that water does as it rushes through things, it just, you know, it erodes, and, and now you had a little stream that was a foot deep, and now you drop down two feet, you know. Um, God reveals himself so many different ways, and one of the ways he's going to do it is through David and Goliath. And so I want to look at the story because, you know, who doesn't like the story? Non-Christians quote David and Goliath all the time. You watch the NCAA tournament and they'll talk about, this is a David and Goliath story. You know, here's this little school that has had, you know, 2,000, 3,000 students and they're taking on a school of 25,000 students and a bigger talent of basketball players. And so David is, you know, defeating them. And, and you know, they, even non-Christians will quote him uh, or talk about David and Goliath all the time because it's a fascinating story. If you get a chance, read the entire chapter 17 of 1 Samuel. We're going to pick up in verse 8. But just to let you know what's happening, Israel's at war with the Philistines. And so they're, they're at this valley. Israel's on one side of the valley. The Philistines uh, are on the other side of the valley. And David's brothers are there. And David's a shepherd. He's the youngest of his family. He's at home watching the sheep. And his dad comes up to him and says, Listen, David, I need to see how your brothers are doing. So take this bread, take this, this, this corn, and go, you know, this roasted corn, go to them and give it to them, and then give me a report of how they're doing. So David goes. And so we pick up right here, 
verse 8 of uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 8. And it says, um, And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel. But he here is talking about Goliath. It said unto them, Why are you come out to set your battle in array? Am not I a Philistine and your servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you, and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and to kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall you be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. Goliath, from what we can tell, is about nine foot nine inches tall. Now that's three feet tall. And I, I, I measured out some, uh, some what, do you call it, just, what do you call the sticks, the stilts one time and exactly how tall he would be. And I stood on them, and my head was up into the ceiling. I was trying to teach the kids. My head's up into the ceiling. He was, he's, about, he's three feet taller than I am, three feet five inches taller than I am. Um, my nephews are six foot nine. They're tall, but Goliath is nine foot nine inches tall. And they said his, uh, when you read a, the, the details of his armor, just his coat of mail, you know, that's just this metal armor like they put on, that's kind of loose or whatever, weighed 125 pounds. You know, I struggle with a 25-pound backpack on my back when I'm hiking, and here's this massive giant, has this coat of armor on him, and it's 125 pounds. The, his spear was, you know, pretty much like a 4x4 four four is how thick it was, and apparently it was made out of brass, or a lot of it was made out of brass, and if you know anything about brass, that's extremely heavy. The head alone of the spear was 15 pounds, um, the, so he's, and then he's got this shield, and his, his shield bearer carries it, and it's this massive shield. I could just imagine this little guy carrying a shield that's probably this much taller than him, hitting his knees, and he's walking, trying to carry it for Goliath. Goliath is this massive guy, scary guy, and all of Israel is average height. Saul, the tallest person at that point in Israel that they knew of, was head and shoulders above all everybody else, but that probably only put him about, you know, in the high six foot, you know, six foot eight, maybe, maybe seven foot, but I doubt it. Um, but everybody else is pretty average height. In America, the average height for men is like five foot six. It's not that, you know, that's, it's surprisingly, but when you look up the average height, it's not that tall. And uh, Lee likes that, you know, <laughs> he's, he's laughing at me right now, but that's like the average height is really not that tall. In Israel, they would have been the same thing. So you have a nine foot nine guy coming out. He had to have been scary. He stands on one side of the valley, and he said, listen, why do we all have to fight? Why don't you just send out your best soldier? He can fight me. And the, when you read the description of what was happening, all the Israelites were just shaking out of fear. You know, uh, someone wrote, you know, their armor is rattling. You know, as they're sitting there listening, all you hear is this rattling of their armor because they're so afraid of this guy. And David shows up, and every day Goliath would come down and challenge him. You know, send your, send your you know, a brave guy to come fight him. And David happens to show up right when Goliath is challenging. And he's insulting. Goliath is insulting Israel. He said, I defy the armies of the Lord this day. You know, send me a guy. He's just really kind of mocking them. All the soldiers are, are frightened. But David, who very likely is about the youngest person there, they, you know, they, they don't know exactly how old he was but he could have been you know, 14, 15 years old. He's really pretty young when you think of being there in this, in this battle. And he's offended. He hears Goliath, and he says in verse 26 of 1 Samuel, David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine and taketh away the reproach from Israel? So he's embarrassed for his own country. He's like, what will be done if someone goes out and takes away this reproach? He's not thinking there's no way that guy's going to die. He's just saying, what's going to happen for the guy who goes out and kills him? He says, for who is this uncircumcised Philistine? He's like, this guy has no right and this is that he should defy the armies of the living God. David is offended that here's this guy, this, yes, he's massive, but he's like, he does not have the right to defy the armies of the living God. What David is, his perspective is very different. It's not about an insult to himself or to the armies. It's about an insult to the living God. So he is offended. 
And he's not afraid because he's looking, that guy is insulting my God and the God that we all claim to be the army of. You know, Israel claims to be the, the God's people. God calls them his people. And he's like, who has, he does not have the right. And he asked, what would happen for anybody to go and kill him? The king had offered this reward. He said, anybody that goes out and kills him, he will get this reward, including my, one of my daughters in marriage. And so the, the people tell him that. Uh, look at verse, we'll skip down to verse 42, because David volunteers to go face Goliath. Understand, again, he's like the youngest guy there. He apparently wasn't super tall himself. Even if he's 14, 15, you know, guys typically grow until they're like 22. Um, so, you know, he's, he's apparently not very tall. He's really young, and yet he volunteers to go against Goliath. So look at verse 42. When the Philistine looked out and saw David, he disdained him. So here's David coming out into the valley. It says he disdained him for he was but a youth and ruddy and a fair countenance. So he's a very handsome little boy. Ruddy, apparently, was like his, maybe his cheeks were red, you know, or, or, or something. You know, he's just this very fair-looking, uh, good-looking kid. And the Philistine is insulted. <laughs> and he's looking at this kid. By the way, David goes and offers to go out and, and, and challenge him. The king, Saul, says, well, then take my armor. Again, the king's pretty tall. David puts the armor on, and it's this massive armor. He goes, I can't use this armor. He goes, I'll just, you know, take what I have. And he takes a sling, which is, you know, we know the story, I think. You know, he takes a sling, which is not the kind of slingshot where you pull back and shoot. It's a sling where you put this rock in and you throw it. And if you've ever used one, typically you break a couple windows practicing. But he's got this sling. He goes out. As he's walking out, the Philistine is insulted. Verse 43, the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog that you come to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me. I will give your flesh unto the fowls of the air and the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the army of Israel, whom you have defied. This day will the Lord deliver you into my hand, and I will smite you and take your head from thee, and I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. But, you know, is, David's motive here is nothing to do about, I want, that, I want that princess. I want that money. I want that fame. He's like, everybody is going to know that this is the army of the living God. And so he comes out with all this incredible, you know, this confidence, not in himself, but in God, because he said, this day will the Lord deliver you unto me. Um, verse 48, oh, verse 47, and all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into your hands. And that's a challenge onto what they're trusting. They're trusting their sword, their spear, their, their ability to fight. And he's like, that's not how God gives victory. And he says, and it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hasted. So David isn't running away, he's running towards uh, Goliath. And, uh, you know, I don't know about you, but I, I was doing paintball wars one time with a couple of our teenagers at the Wilds. Actually, it was Michelle and Brian's daughter, uh, uh, Laura and uh, Hannah um, Morell. And I just charged because we're getting towards the end of the game, so I got, I got shot so many times, you know, they, and they just having a great time, oh, look, it's Mr. Steve, and they just started shooting me, and I had welts all over my chest from the, the pellets, you know, I don't know about you, but it's not a fun thing to charge an enemy, <laughs> you know, and uh, yes, I've forgiven them, but um, I don't know about you, but it's not fun, and here's David, he's running to the biggest guy he'd ever seen that anybody had pretty much seen, and he's trying, this guy is massive, he's got this huge, incredible armor, this big spear, this spear, you know, the this, this shield, his sword, you know, is massive, and David's charging him, and uh, we better keep reading. David put his hand in the bag, took thence a stone, and he put his sling, his sling, and he smote the Philistine in the forehead. The stone sunk into his forehead, and he fell upon his face to the earth. Supposedly, the Philistines didn't just go out with their bare head. They actually had an armor, you know, like a, a helmet. Um, someone said this is the evidence of the first bullet, <laughs> you know, ever. Because it didn't just hit him in the head and it's like, ow, that hurt, and you fall over. 
It actually embedded into his head. And if you had a helmet, it means it went through the helmet to go into his head. All right? And, um, you know, I know you can throw these, these slings and that bull, you know, that brock can do a lot of damage, but to go through metal or whatever, if, that, if the guy had a helmet, it's a miracle because God's the one that, you know, killed Goliath. Goliath fell over. And if you keep reading the story, David goes up, puts his, I think he puts his foot on his chest, grabs Goliath's own sword, chops his head off, grabs the head and holds it up, and the Philistines get scared to death. They take off running. The Israelites are all fired up, and they go chase the Philistines, and they defeat the, the Philistines. But, you know, I think most of us, we dream of being a hero like that. You know, we have this idea that maybe a, some kind of giant challenge will come you know, our friends and our family, maybe they're somewhat in danger or something, and we arrive and we heroically dominate and, you know, the, whatever the problem is, and we decapitate it or whatever, you know, and we're the hero. We get an award or, or whatever, you know, and uh, we kind of live that way or sometimes want to be that way, and it may not be something so physical, and, but just to be the hero of someone's story. But don't lose the real power to this story. It really is not about Goliath. It's not about a young person, that young, killing a monster. It is about a, a very worthy cause that David is involved in. God's name was being disrespected. God's name was being challenged, and David had a problem with that. And so he was, able, he was willing to confront uh, the, the enemy here and fight this battle. Last week, Tyler talked, at least in a little part of his message, about glorifying God, and that's, that's part of what we do, right? Glorifying, to, uh, I always define to glorify is to know God and to, to make him known. So it's not just about your relationship with God, it's you sharing that relationship with others, so you're making him known. The Bible says, and whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. So whatever you're doing, do it to the glory of God. Um, my question is, why should we care? Why should we care whether other people believe that we are God's people? Or other people know that, uh, you know, that, that we serve, you know, who we claim to be the living God? Um, why should we care about how we live, how we worship, how we serve with a local church, or how faithful we are uh, in doing so? Why should we care about, uh, again, worshiping God, edifying one another in our faith, or even evangelizing the lost? So I'm going to give you a few, re a few reasons for this. The first one is as Jesus' disciples, and a disciple is a follower of God to the point where you're, uh, or a disciple of Christ to the point where you're actually being changed by that. Um, I am, there's a lot about me that's just like my dad, and my brothers are the same way, because as we were growing up, in essence, we were, be, we were being mentored by him, obviously. We were being taught by him, and we were uh, you know, we were being you know, kind of formed. We were kind of his disciples, really. He introduced us to God. His passion for, for serving God and serving, you know, and sharing the gospel is all just kind of, he worked, you know, just by following him and listening to him, we became that way. I've told you about the picture that I have someplace, and it's my dad standing like this, and my brother standing like this, and me standing like this, and my little brother standing like this. Without even knowing it, we're all like this. We all do the same thing. We all rub our head like this. My, my dad, my brothers, we all do this. That's why we're all bald right here, I think, you know. And that just carried over to the rest of us, the rest of it. But um, I was watching my brother preach the other day, and there's so much of, a, of how he even preaches that he's like, uh, you know, uh, my dad. And they say the same thing about me. A disciple or someone that doesn't just follow from a distance is someone who's actually influenced by them. They are changed and they become more like that person. So as a disciple of Christ, in other words, you becoming like Christ, we are to make a difference in this world. Here's what Jesus says to his disciples. You can find this in Matthew chapters 13 through 16, but let me just, or Matthew chapter 5 verses 13 through 16. But here's what he says. He says, you are the salt of the earth. And the you he's talking, he pulled his disciples aside, and he's talking specifically to them. He says, you are the salt of the earth. He also says, you are the light of the world. Verse 16, then he says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So by them seeing the light that you are showing, 
They see your good works. They don't glorify you. They glorify God. Um, uh, so salt makes a difference. When you put salt on something, you can tell the difference. right? Light makes a difference. When you walk into a pitch black room and shine your flashlight or turn the light on, it makes a difference. So what Jesus is saying, his disciples need to make a difference. I had to hear in the you know, I've, I've read a little bit about Tesla and Edison and Westinghouse and General Electric. They knew electricity would change the world. Benjamin Franklin, I think, knew that. You know, his famous thing about sending a kite out with, you know, a key or something on it and watching the lightning strike it, and it's amazing he didn't die. It may have, you know, affected him mentally. I don't know. But, you know, they knew, they understood elect electricity would make a difference. And it's interesting that the Bible uses light as a description of how we should live. And we are meant as disciples of Christ, we are meant to make a difference. Peter tells, uh, he's writing his letter, he says, having your conversation honest among Gentiles, the word conversation there means your lifestyle. It's not just what you say, it's the way you live. It's an old English word that means your lifestyle. So having your lifestyle honest among Gentiles that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may, be, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, in other words, they shall see, glorify God in the day of visitation. It's not about them glorifying you. It's about glorifying God. We need to make the difference in such a way that they glorify God. They're not looking to us. You know, there's a lot of criticism about people that go on mission fields and take all these selfies about them helping these little kids and everything. And they're like, why is it all about you? Now, I'm not telling you don't take selfies. You know, I, I'm just saying the, the accusation is sometimes it feels like it's all about the person taking the selfie. Look what I'm doing for God. Um, I, I would argue that if they sat down, if that accuser would sit down with that person taking that selfie, they would find out that, no, it wasn't about them. It was about the fact that they were, they were passionate about helping other people for God's glory. But Peter's challenging us. The way we live, our lifestyle should be such that they would behold our good works and God would uh, be glorified here. So what we uh, are, are seeing here is that believers are supposed to make a difference, not only in here, but to the outside world. Someone put, said this, simply put, the most common factor in a declining church is an inward focus. Uh, and the idea there is it's a holy huddle. <laughs> You talk about a huddle, we all get together, but we're all the same team, and let's just stick together. No one from the other team can come over here. Let's just stick together, you know. Uh, we have a really good uh, seat warming program, but do we have just as good a program of getting out and trying to fill the seats is, is the idea. So um, a church needs to see itself, a believer needs to see himself or herself as having been created for the purpose of making a difference in the world. So I think it's important that we glorify God like David did because God's people are meant to make a difference. Uh, Goliath should have never felt confident in challenging the God of Israel. You know, he should have known this is the wrong person, the wrong army to challenge. Let's go to someone else. Uh, there's a lot of times in Scripture you see stories about people saying, your God can't help you. There's a guy named Sennacherib, I think his name is, in, in uh, Jeremiah or Isaiah. And they're, they're telling Israel or Judah, do not you know, feel confident in your God. We've destroyed all the other nations around you and their gods. There is no God that can stand up against us. And God tells Isaiah and then tells Hezekiah the king, says, don't worry about him. He's going to get a message to go home real quick, and then he's going to die at home. And sure enough, the Bible says that... Um, he got a message, this king who was challenging Judah and the God of Judah got a message to go home. There was some emergency, so he goes all the way back to Babylon or Egypt or whatever, uh, or maybe it was Assyria. He gets there, and his own sons kill him. And there's another, the same army comes back with a different leader, and they're like, just because that happened, don't think you got away with this. And God says, don't worry about them. They're going to fight among themselves. Or they're going to they're be destroyed. And something happens and they, own, they, they died without even getting into battle. And it's just multiple times that God is saying, I am, you are my people, I'm taking care of you. And when, Israel, when God's people neglected glorifying God, that's when others like challenging him. Others like, oh, you know, we, we don't have nothing to worry about. Your God is just as bad as everybody else's. 
We are meant to make a difference. God's people are meant to make a difference. Not only that, um, it's, uh, we also there, we have to understand that what is happening, and we are in the best position to fight this battle, but there's a spiritual warfare going around, around us. The, the sin issues that you have in your life, the sin issues you have in your family, the battles that you have going on, it's a spiritual battle that is happening. And uh, let me just read you some of these verses, Ephesians 3.10, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church, the manifold wisdom of God. What, what Paul is saying in Ephesians, and he says it multiple times, that there are principalities and powers in heavenly places. That's not heaven like we know heaven. It's the universe, in a sense, and there's these battles, these powers that are, are fighting, and God has ordained the church, which is God's people, those who have trusted Christ, he has chosen them to show the manifold wisdom of God. We are meant to make a difference. There's a spiritual warfare going on. We're fighting against these principalities and powers, and so we should fight these battles. And you see examples of the spiritual warfare. There's things that are happening today that make absolutely no sense in the sense of how wicked they are. You know, not too long ago, there was that story in the Bible of a mother right, driving her minivan into the ocean to kill herself and her kids. You know, we see people shooting other people just for the fun of it, you know, or out of vengeance or something. In Albuquerque, there was, you know, there was about four people that killed in the last couple of um, uh, weeks. And it, apparently, and we don't know all the truth yet, but apparently a guy was upset. You know, he was mad. And they all went to the same mosque or something, and, and he just went after them and, and, and killed them. And you see, you know, suicide rate going up. You see, you know, alcoholism going up or drunkenness going up. You see all these things happening. Um, and so it's just obvious there's something behind it, and that something is a spiritual battle. We are in the best place to fight that. Ephesians chapter, um, well, well, Daniel, by the way, there's a story, and you can look at it, Jan Daniel chapter 10. I didn't want to put all these verses because I already had a lot of pages I wanted to go through. So, Daniel sees a vision from God and recognizes that there's something's going to happen to Israel. So he starts to pray. And for three weeks he prays and nothing happens. He's praying and he's fasting and praying for three weeks and nothing happens. At the end of the three weeks, finally, an angel shows up and tells Daniel, I was on my way three weeks ago and I had to fight my way here and it took three weeks. Now it's interesting because there's this spiritual battle going on and, uh, and you can find it in Daniel. And it took three weeks for that angel to get there to answer that, uh, you know, the, those, those uh, prayers. You see it in Ephesians chapter uh, 6. Paul says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. So that's where we get our strength. That's where we get the power. That's why I'm saying we have, are in the best place to help fight this spiritual battle. Put on the whole armor of God that you might be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. There's the spiritual warfare. The wiles is the trickery and the deception of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. It's not a physical battle, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all, to stand. And then he goes on and talks about that armor of God. That armor of God involves the truth. It involves righteousness, the gospel, faith, salvation, the word of God, and prayer. Prayer is such an important part of spiritual warfare. The Bible is such an important part of spiritual warfare. Growing in our relationship with God, our understanding of what the truth is, understanding of what righteousness is, the gospel is, our faith growing, our, our confidence in the salvation that we have, and sharing that gospel, sharing that salvation, all that is how we fight uh, this battle. But we are in a battle no matter what. And God's people are meant to make a difference. We are meant, if you know Christ as your Savior, you are meant to make a difference in the spiritual battle that is going on. Uh, there's another reason that I think we should be actively involved in standing up for the glory of God and fighting for the glory of God and it's that there are many who have come before us, gave their lives so that we could hear the gospel, that we, and so we need to continue in the race. And I'll just read this. It's Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 that says, Wherefore, seeing that we are surrounded 
or come past by so great a cloud of witnesses, we lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. That, by the way, is part of the spiritual battle. Laying aside the things that slow us down, fighting the sin that so easily besets us. So we lay aside the sin which so easily besets us. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. So, you know, we're growing in our, in our, our faith in, in Christ. And it says, uh, Who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. That last part is it talking, it's, a, it's the gospel. We are surrounded by witnesses that gave their life for faith and lived by faith. And so the challenge is that we run the same race um, before us. So it refers to all those because of their faith in God, did wonderful things that glorified God, and so we should do those same things. Now, I look at the old, these old witnesses, and, and you know, like Noah builds an ark, and, and Enoch walks with God, is taken up to heaven. Um, David kills Goliath. There's multiple stories like that. Those aren't necessarily the great things that we need to do. The real great uh, work of God is not killing Goliath, it's not having an ark build, it's not you know, splitting the, the, the Red Sea so people can cross. The biggest work is saving people, is rescuing them from the cost of their sin, from the eternal separation from God. We are all part of that. We not only benefited from the salvation God gave us, but we are challenged and commanded to be part of sharing that same truth and that same gospel to those around us. Um, in uh, uh, 1 Corinthians, Paul, this is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul says something along the lines that, you know, I have suffered all these things. What's the point if the gospel isn't true? But then he concludes, but the gospel is true. I'm very willing to suffer all these things. And he did. I mean, he had beatings. He got stoned. He had to face, apparently he had to face some wild animals. His life was in danger. He was shipwrecked and he got bit by a viper. You know, all these things. He suffered all these things. And he said, what would be the point if the gospel wasn't true? But let me tell you, the gospel is true. It's worthy of suffering these things. And he is one of those witnesses that we need to look at, and then we need to lay aside that weight and that sin that so easily besets us and live our lives in, in sacrifice, really, to God and for the glory of God. A part of one of the reasons I wanted to talk about this, my dad was, uh, I, I got to preach in my dad's church the two Sundays ago, and when I finished, he got up there and he just said this phrase, he says, the commission is the mission. And the commission is go out and make disciples. Every believer has that. And he says, that is the mission. That is your purpose in life. Everything else that you do should lead to you lead, fulfilling that purpose. We are all, as believers, commanded to, to, to share the, the gospel and to make disciples. Um, men and women have put their lives on the line so that we could hear the gospel and pass it on down to us, and we should uh, uh, follow in their footsteps as well. Why finish the mission? 1 Corinthians 15, 34 says, Awake to righteousness, sin not. In other words, let your conversation, let your lifestyle be such that you're laying aside the weight that so easily besets you, the sin that so easily besets you. Lay that aside. Why? Because some don't have the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. He's talking to Christians. People don't have the knowledge of God, and I speak this uh, to your shame. So he says, wake up. Live like you are righteous. Why? Because some don't know God, and you need to you know, share him with them. This is what David was fighting for. He's fighting for the knowledge of God. You know, we have a giant to fight because people need to see the glory of God. And then he says, I, Paul says, I speak this to the shade, the shame and the fact that we are uh, inwardly, it's all about us instead of sharing it you know, uh, with others. There's uh, one of my favorite movies, and I've shared this illustration with, with you before, but my, my favorite movies of all time are The Lord of the Rings. And the whole story is there's this one ring that if the wrong person controls it, then there will be no hope to fighting evil. That's the whole story, right? And so it's a journey from the very first uh, book to where a short little guy, they call them hobbits. They're not real. It's not a true story, obviously. It's, it's, it's kind of a, a, there is some of, it seems like some biblical uh, you know, simulants in it, whatever, but it's not a true story. But this little guy named Frodo was given the ring because he, was, he, he could resist the evil of it. 
And, there, and if you wore that ring too long, eventually it would control you, and you would want to control the whole world, and you would just do evil things. You know? So the whole story is him traveling with a group of friends, and then eventually just one friend to this one place, the only place in the whole universe where they could destroy this ring. But as the journey goes along, the, the ring controls him more and more, and he gets to the point where he wants to keep the ring. So he's at the, the, the volcano, volcano where he can destroy the ring. There's a battle going on with all his friends fighting the evil enemy, and they're fighting to give a distraction so that he can destroy the ring. And the, the scene of the end of that movie, these guys are all out there. A lot of them are dying. They're giving their life. And the hobbit, his name's Frodo, is standing there. He's got the ring. All he needs to do is throw it in the fire, and it would be destroyed. And instead, he says, no, I am keeping it. And he puts it on his hand, and um, eventually, it accidentally falls in the fire. And, you know, he's still sort of the hero. But I, when I watch that, and I sit there, how many times have we said, no, I am going to do this? Well, our friends and our family are over here dying, and we're choosing something that we desire, something that we want. We need to be concerned. We need to be making a difference. The glory of God is what the world needs to see. And so we need to live our lives in such that we, you know, that, that God is glorified. That's why David's question to the army of Israel is very important. And he says, who, why are we letting, he didn't say it this way, I'm paraphrasing, but why are we letting the enemy def defy the army of the living God? They should never have to ask the question, is there no God in, at Eastside, or is there no God in Mooresville, is there no God in the United States, right? Because we are living such our life and making such a difference in the way we live that God is being uh, glorified. Now, you might be here and you have no idea what we're talking about. As far as you're concerned, this is kind of just a, uh, you know, kind of a weird place to be. But uh, let me just tell you why we're here. Most of us, if not all of us that are Christians here, at one point, we realized that we wanted a relationship with God. Now, it was all, you know, I was pretty young when I realized this, but, um, and so they, you know, our understanding may have been different at the time, but at some point, we came to the realization, I want to know God. And immediately we became aware of the fact that sin was getting between us and God. The Bible says all have sinned and all come short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. That death is that means we're separated from God. And so we have this desire to know God, but we have this big problem in the fact that we are sinners and we are separated from God. But then, according to the Scriptures, which is God's Word and His revelation to us, He says that God provided a way for us to have life. That life means we're no longer separated from God. That life not only can start here, but that life means we would live for eternity in the presence of God. And it was based on the fact that this man, who was perfect, his name was Jesus, and when we study Scripture, we realize that Jesus was actually God that came, became a man. He grew, an innocent, he grew up a sinless, perfect life. And yet he was killed for our sins. He took our place. And when he died on the cross, he made that payment for the sin that we, you know, for us as sinners, he paid for our sin. The Bible says he was buried. He was separated from God. But then the Bible says after three days he resurrected. And what he does is he offers us new life. He not only paid for our sins, he now offers us new life. And so those of us in here who are Christians at some point came to realize, I want to know God. Jesus is the way to get to know God. And so we are basing our trust and our faith that Jesus, when he died, he paid for our sins. The cost was completely covered. He resurrected from the dead, which means that we now have new life. It's just as if we had never sinned, and we now are part of the family of God. And if you have any doubts about your relationship with God or any questions about whether you are, are part of God's family, my invitation to you is to talk to me or my my. Um, well, I better ask uh, maybe Haley to stand in the back with me and, uh, you know, to, so the, there's a girl out there that you can talk to. But you can talk to us about how I can know Christ as my Savior. And we will show you from Scripture, not something that we made up. This is not the doctrine according to Steve. It's what the Bible says and what most of us in this room believe about how we can be right with God. Then comes the desire to let everybody else know. And so the challenge, yes, to all those who aren't Christians or to our Christians is glorify God in every area of your life. 
be bold in making a difference in the, in, in the world around you. But my invitation to those who don't know God now is to trust Christ as your Savior. We'll uh, pray, and then Ricky will come up and lead us in another song as we also take up our offering to finish. Thank you, Father, for the privilege it is to know you and for putting us in us the desire to know you and then making it possible through Jesus Christ to pay for our sins and to give us new life so that we can have this relationship with you. But it doesn't end with us. I pray that you will burden our hearts to lay aside the weight and the sin that so easily besets us and to live a life in such that those who see us see good works and you are glorified in their desires to know you also. And it brings them to the point of trusting Christ as their Savior so they too can have a relationship with you. And may we make the difference in this community, in our families, and in our life that would honor you. Lord, I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. We're going to end with song we did earlier this morning, In Need. Sing with me if you would.